also received his PhD at Limburger University Center in Belgium. And he has done a postdoc at University of California, San Diego, and University Federal Fluminense. And since 2006, he has been a professor at UFPE. And his main research is related to the application of statistical physics and nonlinear dynamics on computational neuroscience. So, Professor Mauro, you have the word. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank you guys for inviting me to, uh, for this conference. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be virtually here. And I'm going to be talking about uh, criticality and cortical states. So I understand most of you guys are physicists and so I am, so am I. I, I mean, I used to be a physicist at least. I, I don't know what I am right now. I've been working with biology for a long time. Um, but you will see that the things I'm going to try to do here, uh, I'm going to try to present to you today, uh, relate to physics strongly, so to my background. Um, so I'll try to, to explain to you what um, criticality is, this is easier for physicists, and what cortical states are and why we think there's some connection between the two, okay? So um, first I'd like to, uh, uh, start by acknowledging and thanking my, my, my collaborators. So Pedro Carelli here, uh, I'm sorry, I did something stupid here. So Pedro Carelli uh, is my, uh, a professor here uh, in Recife and the work I'm going to be de describing today was done mostly, uh, was leaded, led by Antonio Fontanelli, a former PhD student, Nivaldo Vasconcelos, a former postdoc in our group. And the second part of the talk was done mostly by Tawan Carvalho, um, uh, currently our, my graduate student, PhD student. Okay, and there's also data from Portugal that are going to be presenting and also collaborators from Mauricio Gerard de Chapo in, in, in Canada, Leonardo de la Porte in Spain and Siddhartha Ribeiro in Natal. So, oh, and people who gave me the money. So, um, uh, FACEPI, and CNPQ, CAPES and FAPESP as well. So the, the bigger context of what I'm going to talk about, I think, to keep the, in the back of your hand, is the following. Do we have a theory for how the brain works? And the question is, of course, as you know in physics, how good or how bad a theory is, it depends on what you compare it with, right? So we need a scale. So what is our natural scale for a theory, for a theoretical science? It's physics, right? So uh, theoretical physics um, in this comparison it's like a well you know, cared for uh, golf course, which is very well studied, very well established. Every detail matters, right? So we test whether anti-proton with anti-electron make anti-hydrogen with the same spectrum to I don't know how many orders uh, of um, many decimal places in procedures of all the constants we know. So the theoretical physics is a, is a very clean uh, theoretical structure, okay? We have some small issues here like dark matter, uh, which are, we, we, I'm, not going to, I'm not talking about, but okay, it's a well-established theory. It has a, a couple of centuries since uh, Galileo or Newton, right? So compared to that, compared to that, from a theoretical point of view, this is what neuroscience looks like. It's like a, a jungle in which you, you have uh, this, you, you cannot see much, and sometimes you just cut some branch and you find gold somewhere because nobody had looked at before. So it's a very new field as compared to physics, especially as compared to theoretical physics, okay? If you try to compare the ideas that are um, discussed in theoretical neuroscience to understand theoretically how the brain works. So it's kind of new. The things we can do are, are very simple, actually. That's the nice thing. You, you can still do simple theory in, in, in your science and try to make sense of the data and the, what's going on. So in this context, I present you, I'll give you some brief uh, uh, um, history of neuronal avalanches and brain criticality, okay? So in 2003, John Baggs and Dietmar Plains published this uh, very important paper uh, in which they took a 60 electrodes measuring activity of uh, slices of our red cortex. So this is not a live animal, this is a, a piece of the brain in a petri dish, okay? And they measure the spontaneous activity. So here in, in this second plot, you have uh, time in one axis and then the 60 electrodes here. 
and you, you, you're measuring what is called local field potential. So this like an average electrical activity around each of these electrodes. And you see they have, you have some silence essentially, and you have some like large deflections and then more silence, quote unquote, and then some other, another collected deflection. It looks like synchronized deflections, but they're actually not. Uh, when you look in, into, uh, into this time series, you can binarize these theories by using some pressure criteria, for instance. And when you look at this uh, ser uh, time series in more detail here, like in four milliseconds kind of scale, you see that you have like a spatial temporal pattern between two silences, okay? So you have to wait a long quote unquote time between those two events to occur. And when they do occur, uh, it's called a, a neuronal avalanche because of the separation of time scale, okay? So this is called neuronal avalanche in due to the separation of time scale, like you have in a snow avalanche, you have to wait, I don't know, months or weeks for snow to accumulate. And then when the relaxation process occurs, it, it, it lasts like you know, seconds or minutes stops. So they look at, at the following, they make a very simple question. So if you assign the size of an avalanche, like the number of, of significant events that happen here, like let, let's call this S for size of an avalanche, what is the typical number of electrodes that uh, get lit up in this event? If you wait, if you collect enough statistics, it's a very simple experimental setup. When you do this and you calculate actual probability distribution of the size S, what you find is that uh, here I'm showing probability as a, as a function of size. So this is neuronal avalanche size distribution, okay? Please note the log log plots here. So no matter how you define the size of an avalanche or no matter how you split your, your um, electrode array, you always get a power law. So the distribution of avalanche sizes is a power law with an exponent very well fit by 1.5, three halves, okay? And so what, right? So what? It is an important result because that, that these are uh, a power law is a fat tail distribution. That means that if you ask typical questions like, what is the mean size of an avalanche? What is the typical size of an avalanche? What is its uh, mean plus or minus standard deviation? All those questions are meaningless because if you have a fat distribution, uh, your, uh, your standard deviation diverges essentially, right? It diverges. So it doesn't make sense to talk about the typical process because fluctuations rule your process. So this is an important point. So this is, a, it can go by several fancy names like non-trivial scale invariant statistics. So if you change the scale of the system, this, this, the, the probability distribution keeps the same exponent. And this fueled the critical brain hypothesis. So this experimental result was essential to reinforce some ideas that had been thought about in the previous decades, but they were just conjectures. The critical brain hypothesis is the idea that the brain as a dynamical system operates near a critical point, okay? So if you want, it goes back to Turing in the, in the 50s, and then per back and then to Kelvin in the 90s, in the context of self-organized criticality, was, which was very uh, hot topic in the 90s, and discussed this issue. So there are a couple of, I'm just mentioning two, two more or less recent reviews, Dante Kelvin into nature physics, it's almost 10 years now, and Woody Shu and Dietmar Plantin, neuroscientists, who discuss these ideas. So the idea is more or less the following. If you have some kind of, what is the critical point? Uh, in, the, in, in this right plot, I show you uh, a two a, a caricature of, of a, a second order phase transition in which in the horizontal axis, you have like a control parameter. In the vertical axis, you have an order parameter. This is the kind of thing we study in uh, statistical mechanics courses in our physics graduate courses, okay? so. This could be, for instance, temperature in the, in the horizontal axis or one over temperature here, and the vertical axis like the, the magnetism of the Ising model, for instance. So if you lower the temperature enough or if your gain beta is large enough, you have spontaneous magnetization um, above a certain critical point. So the idea is that the brain would be here in this red point or around this point. Because why? Because here at this red point, you have uh, rich dynamics uh, have a lot of features that appear in models that would you think would be the desired for the brain. And the question, of course, then is if the brain is critical, what is the phase transition? So these ideas were floating around when this experimental paper that I told you, told you about um, appeared, okay? So 
um, very um, singles like course on phase transitions, um, at this critical point or near this critical point, you have non trivial scale invariant behavior, which is characterized by critical exponents. For instance, um, the way the order parameter um, takes off uh, at the critical point is case with exponent beta, for instance, one of the name of exponents. The response is external stimuli. At, crit at the critical point, uh, it scales at with uh, one exponent, one over del delta H. So for instance, for those uh, uh, magnetism aficionados, you, 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 take the, uh, you take the IC model and put it at critical temperature TC, and then you apply a, a, a magnetic field, uh, the response of the magnetization would be, which will be F here as a function of the external field H would be uh, H to the power one third in, in the mean field, for instance, okay? You have something, things like divergent autocorrelation time. So typically if you look at your system here and now, and if you look at the system a couple of seconds or uh, sometime T later, it will decay exponentially with some characteristic time TC. But as you approach the critical point here, TC diverges with some critical exponent. So I'm just, I'm just giving you some examples of um, scaling variant behavior near the critical point. And of course, if you can properly define avalanches, which is not always the case, easy, um, then the size of, of an avalanche scales with, the, with the, uh, the probability distribution of a size S scale with S to the power minus tau, another critical exponent, and the duration, the lifetime of an avalanche the probability distribution of avalanche uh, lifetimes also scales with the lifetime to the power uh, minus tau t. So tau and tau t are two different critical exponents. And if two different models belong, if two different models have the same exponents, even if they are different, they belong to the same universality class. That's the concept of, univer of universality class that appears in statistical mechanics and um, made um, many people famous and gave some Nobel prizes. So. So what is the universality class for this kind of uh, critical brain? Well, we don't know, but since those results uh, from Bex and Place came out with tau here equals three halves, that, that's the experimental result that I showed you, people start talking about uh, the so-called standard model for neuronal avalanches, which will be main field directed percolation. So this very long name actually amounts to a very simple thing. It is, it's a model well known since the late 19th century which where it was known as the branching process. So essentially, uh, assume you have a bunch of neurons here in green, so at, at some point in time, they're green, they're, they're active. And then with some probability, they reproduce this activity, they, uh, they transmit this activity to other neurons if they're quiescent, they're, they're uh, able to spike. To, and then if this probability is small enough, you see that eventually this activity will die out and you will reach a, a, a state where no, no neuron is spiking there's no activity, you have silence, death. So this is called the absorbing state in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, okay? Um, on the other hand, if this probability is high, you can imagine that the probability will, I mean, if each spike I have here, I'm sorry, is anyone speaking? Okay, so if I give a spike here and it propagates with a lot, lots of probability, I say I, can, I have 10 neighbors, for instance, and five of them will spike, I have one spike and then on average five, and then on average 25, and there you go, you see, it goes exponentially, um, unless of course have some limitation, which neurons do. But then you have some self-system activity as the, as the uh, and stable phase. So this is the supercritical phase. The other is the supercritical one. And then at the critical point, you have just right the probability where you are on the verge of dying and not dying. And if activity does die out, it will die out without a characteristic time scale, right? So this is the simple branching process or being field directed percolation kind of um, hand waving explanation. So it's a phase of issue between an absorbing state and an active phase, okay? Uh, here you can see time series. So this is density as a function of time of, of, of just a very simple model that we published in 2006. Uh, if you have, if you are below this control parameter sigma, which controls essentially the probability that you're going to spike, uh, it goes, ex decays exponentially fast to zero. If you're above the critical point, you stay active forever essentially. And if you're below the, the if, you're, if you're at the critical point, you do die out, but it takes longer. And there's a lot of fluctuation here. It, it, the, the survival time is, is the power law distribution as well. Okay, so to, just to give a, a hint of the scenario. 
So for this kind of model, in this kind of mean field uh, behavior, or in networks with a, a, a high uh, topological dimension, infinite topological dimension, like um, a random graph, something like that, you have uh, tau equals three halves and tau t equals two. And this is the mean field directed calculation. This tau equals three halves that I'm showing here in theory is what you observe in the experimental data from Bagson Place in 2003, okay? 2003 was a long time ago. So many things happened in there. So even though people still work on this kind of, uh, this kind of model, including myself, there are problems. For instance, experimentally, the avalanche exponent, exponents are not always tau equals three halves and tau t equals two. I can show several examples. I'm going to show you just one. This is from a paper uh, in uh, 2015 by Woody Shu and collaborating on nature, nature physics, where they looked at the ex vivo uh, turtle visual cortex. So it's a very strange exponent for a physicist. Uh, you remove the whole brain of a turtle, including its retinas. And with the brain outside of the skull, so the animal is dead already, but the brain is alive somehow, you can measure uh, the visual cortex of the turtle while uh, the, the, turtle, the retina is um, simulated by some uh, natural images, okay? So you can do the whole avalanche analysis again and look at the statistics of avalanches and look at the size distribution of avalanche and, and extract the exponent tau. And you, look at, and you look at the lifetime distribution of an avalanche and, and, and extract the um, lifetime exponent tau t. And you look whether it looks like 1.5 and 2, which, is the, which are the values predicted by this kind of theory, by mean field direct population theory, okay? Well, their results were so, so uh, variable that they actually had a plane where they plotted the exponents. So this is a plot of exponents. Right. So just this should, just to be sure. So one critical uh, you have a, a, a given model uh, with a well if, if it has a well defined critical point, it has a well defined value of the exponents, not a plane of exponents. Okay. So if you compare with the theory, tau t equals two is here on the scale, and tau equals th uh, three halves or one point five is out of their scale. It's here. So the right the black dots are the experimental, the experimental results. And the red dot is a theory, mean field directed calculation. So it doesn't look very good, right? Uh, it's debatable at best whether this standard model is the right one. Um, moreover, some previous results uh, also suggest an intriguing dependence of power law distributions on the so called level of, of synchronization of the data. Let, let me show you the, the, the plots to, to see whether it's clear, what, uh, it becomes clear what I mean by that. So I'm going to show you results from a previous paper of our group in 2010, okay, in, in plus one. And so it's 10 years old already. So we took data from freely behaving rats and from um, anesthetized rats from Siddhartha Ribeiro's lab in Natal. So here I'm showing in the left plot, uh, WK means wake. So this is an awake animal. And you see this kind of very asynchronous behavior in the in the data, and if you if you submit the animal to a very deep doses of ketamine xylazine anesthesia, it's a specific kind of anesthesia from which the animal can then recover and wake up later. During the anesthesia, you have this very kind of synchronous behavior. You have like lots, lots of neuron spikes, then silence, and then more neuron spikes, and then silence again, right? So. When you try to do avalanche analysis on this kinds of data, on this kind of data, you will see that it depends whether you are here or here. So essentially, what I'm showing here in the left is probability distribution of avalanche sizes, and you see that you have one, two, three, four, five different curves, and these different curves correspond to uh, like half-hour intervals between very well anesthetized here in the in the bottom figures. And then you wait half an hour for the ammo to wake up a little bit, more, another half an hour, another half hour, another half hour. By the time it is fully wake, waking up in the top uh, plots here, you have less synchronous behavior and you don't have a very well established power law. In fact, we show this statistically, this, the, the upper curves are not power laws at all. They're more compatible with, with log normals. Whereas here in the bottom curves, you do have power laws. Well, it looks like power law in a, in a small range. But even when you do have some kind of power law, you see these three three sets of laws are to uh, of different animals. Okay, 
even the exponents, this should be tau, but at the time it was called alpha. Uh, the, the exponents are not always 1.5 and are not always even close to 1.5 like in the late, last one, okay? And what about synchronization? Why should it depend on the level of synchronization? The standard model that I talked talk to you about doesn't even mention synchronization. You have uh, absorbing state or active phase. So it was very confusing. If it is confusing to you, welcome. It was confusing to us as well. We were very confused, confused for a long time. What is going on? Is my mean field directed percolation uh, gone? Should be abolished? Should it be abolished? Can we test that? What do we do? We spent a lot of time not knowing what to do, okay? Um, so you have these oscillations. So let me briefly review what uh, brain waves look like and what is, an, is understood about it. a little, a little, uh, a bit of its, its, its history, okay? Just for, because I think it's interesting for, especially for physicists who are not used to this kind of history. So this is a long history from the early, tw uh, from the twenties when Hans Berger measured the first uh, human electro uh, encephalogram. So with one, one uh, electrode here and another one to, so you have, you have to compare uh, voltage differences, right? He measured like uh, in the occipital, um, Lobe here in the back of your head, some uh, frequencies with 10 hertz frequency. When you close your eyes, your your um, V1, your primary visual cortex, will show this kind of signature in in the EEG electroencephalogram. Okay, and this is early 20s. Nowadays, you can do with many more channels. You do with I don't know 128, 256 channels, and actually you can even buy one of these things. Okay. So this is a, a, a commercial web page in which you can buy a, a couple, I think, I don't know how many, many channels it has, this, this headset, which you then pair with, uh, via Bluetooth with your cell phone and you can, you can guide your, your, you can try to uh, uh, mess with your meditation, okay? So from this side, from the commercial side, you, you have a summary of human brain waves, like the different frequencies, main frequencies, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta, depending on the frequency and what it means. For instance, so alpha, which is the one I showed before, means physically and mentally relaxed. So if you close your eyes, those alpha oscillations emerge in your, in your, in your, in the back of your head. Okay. So this is the a very simple measurement, which it, because it's non-invasive, very easy to do, but it's also very noisy. Okay. Uh, you can go deeper. You can insert electrodes in the brain of an animal. You cannot do this with humans, but with animals you can do. So if you measure local field potential, which is the kind of average activity that I mentioned before, you see this kind of activity here. If you go deeper, you, you see it better. If you measure spikes inside by inserting an ele electrode inside your neurons, then it's a beautiful signal like here, 20 millivolts. Um, local field potential, spikes, Again, uh, please look, note the different scales here, okay? Uh, 150 mic microvolts for, for EEG, and then it goes, get, gets uh, larger for a local field potential and even larger for spikes. And this is when you, you, you will make the, the spikes discrete is what you see. So uh, just as a curiosity for uh, theoretical physicists, how do you acquire multiple spikes simultaneously? You, you can make for instance multi electrode arrays. This is a picture that I took with my, my cell phone, my old cell phones, uh, many years ago when we were starting our, our electrophysiology lab uh, here in Recife. So, this is early days. I'm showing here a, a, a five cent uh, coin, so you, have a, 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 you can compare the scales. And this is, a, uh, in, this is an intermediate process of um, uh, a multi electrode array manufacturer. So here you cannot see very well. I'm sorry, the, the picture is very bad. My, my phone was very bad. You have a four by eight uh, matrix of silica tubes, okay? Uh, which are very thin. They have, they're like 100, uh, 100 micron diameter, more like 150 micron diameter. And so you glue them together to, to form this array. So this is a technique we learned from Marcio Moraes, <coughs> I'm sorry, in Federal University of Belo Horizonte, uh, Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte, okay? And then you, you, you buy those tungsten, uh, coated tungsten wires, which you insert inside those, those, those uh, tubes and have, now you have a matrix. Then you have to weld everything together, connect with, with, a, specific, specific, uh, with a specific connector, and then you can insert this, this thing uh, into the rat's brain. So this is 
uh, in the middle of the manufacturing process. At the end of the manufacturing process, it will look more like this with a better picture and a better photographer and a better cell phone, okay? So this is homemade. And the beauty of this process is, is that it is uh, much more, much cheaper to do. Uh, it costs, I don't know, $50 uh, instead of $500, which is what it would cost if you would buy, if you were to buy it from uh, uh, some industrial, some company, okay? And the nice thing is that you then you can, if, it, if it's so cheap, you can insert even in freely behaving animals like we're doing with this animal here. And you can record it because when you insert with a free behavior animal, you have to put uh, cement into the, 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 the rat skull. So everything is, is, is well fixed. But after the experiment, the animal is sacrificed and you lose the matrix. So you cannot do this. Well, I don't have money to do this with expensive matrices, okay? But this is the good side. The bad side is that the way the way we do this matrix because of the tungsten, because of the, the welding, because of everything, the, your signal to noise ratio is not that good. So you have a lot of noise. You do not always know if you really are measuring some neuron activity or just noise. Okay, so this is the way we did uh, in the early days and the way we still do when we have uh, free behaving animals. For more precise uh, experiments, for the results I'm going to show it to you today, we don't use this um, homemade setup. We have professional silicon probes, which then you have to buy, it costs, I don't know, thousand dollars each or something. So you have very thin um, silicon um, shanks, like we call them. So you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight shank shanks here, at the tip of which you find those very small channels by which you measure uh, uh, activity. Okay, so this is 200 micron across, and the spacing here between the, those two, the, those different electrodes, is like 20 microns. So 20 microns is more or less the, the, the same order of magnitude of the size of a, of a neuronal of a neuron. Okay, so you have many neurons very close to these uh, electrodes, so you can differentiate one one. Uh, three, two, three different electrodes can pick up the signal from one single neuron. So then you can, via triangulation, detect which spikes come from which neurons. So in this 64 channel uh, uh, um, uh, silicon probe, you can measure up to, I don't know, 100 and something neurons, okay? <coughs> or 100 neurons. And we got data in our lab and data from, uh, um, um, Nuno Souza's lab in, in Portugal. Nuno Souza and Maria João, uh, Ana João's lab in, in, in Portugal. So, what about brain waves and spikes? So, I talked about brain waves in, in EEG, stuff like this. What about spikes? So, the understanding uh, now we enter into cortical states finally. The idea, I, I'm taking this from, uh, from Nature Neuroscience, uh, uh, Nature Review Neuroscience paper from um, 2011. And the idea is that your brain is not always operating the same way, okay? It changes behavior, behaviors and the way it behaves, the way it operates. And, the, and this change in ways of operating uh, is characterized by what biologists call cortical states. So I state in, in, in neuroscience, uh, we should be careful here because physics states means something else. So if you are uh, in, in a state in, so let's say, in phase space of a harmonic oscillator is a position and momentum, right? So I give a, I give a state in, in, in phase space, and from there you can propagate your activity for the future. Here is something else. A cortical state here in your science is the dynamics of natural activity in a time scales of second. So it looks more like uh, 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 the notion of state in thermodynamics. So you have a like liquid state or solid state in the sense that they are. Uh, macroscopically different. So this is more uh, akin to what I'm describing here for cortical states in neuroscience, okay? <laughs> Perhaps it's easier if, if I, if I uh, exemplify it. So let's have a look of what a synchronized state looked like. So the synchronized state you see here in the upper plot, the red plot, like the, um, if you could measure spikes from a single neurons, from a single neuron. And the lower plot is like the local field potential you measure from many neurons uh, around an electrode. And the uh, intermediate plot, you see these little ticks, uh, uh, yellow, red, 
the yellow, sorry, green and blue ticks are the spikes from different neurons. So yellow will be one neuron, green another neuron, and blue one neuron. So it's called synchronized because activity seems to, seems to be occurring in a synchronous way between the different spikes, right? So this is what you expect, this is what you observe if the animal is drowsy, quiescent, so or in slow wave sleep. So this is a particular kind of sleep that is very deep sleep, the animal is doing nothing. So this is what you observe. Your, your, your brain becomes synchronous. Like I mentioned in the EEG, right? If you're measuring from your, your visual cortex here in the back of your head and you close your eyes, you do some, you do see some slow synchronous behavior. Now, you also have this desynchronized state. You, you look at the different neurons here, the different colors. They're not spiking at the same time now. And the local field potential is also faster and without these large oscillations. And this is what we observe uh, in the brain, in the rat's brain, when it is actively behaving or alert, right? If the animal is supporting something, this is what a brain activity looks like. So more specifically, you can look at look for low frequency, lo uh, local field potential fluctuation here in synchronized state, and less low frequency uh, local field uh, LFP fluctuations in the desynchronized state. More importantly for us, you can look for correlated spike in activity in the synchronized state. So if you take you have n neurons, you have n n minus one over two pairs of neurons. You can look for each of these pairs. You can calculate the spiking uh, correlation between those two neurons and make a histogram. Okay. If you do this for the synchronized state, this is the kind of histogram of pairwise spike correlation you're going to observe. You have some width here, but the average is positive. So you have more correlation than anti-correlation or no correlation, okay? Compare that with the uh, uh, desynchronized state when you expect uncorrelated spiking activity. So if you, if you take again the pairs and you make the co pairwise correlation and you do the statistics, you, you obtain a, a histogram, which is essentially around zero, okay? So essentially it's around zero. Right, so um, the crucial issue here is that cortical state is not bimodal. It's not like you have only those two modes of operation. Essentially, this separation that I, I, draw, I drew here uh, to call your attention to it is a, a artificial. In fact, you have a continuum of uh, synchron, a continuum of so-called synchronization kind of thing. Synchronization here is being employed in a very loose sense, okay? It's very important to emphasize that. And we were wondering, given the conundrum, the, the problem we had with, with our avalanche statistics, in which for one kind of anesthetized rats, we had uh, avalanche um, power law distributed avalanche, whether for non anesthetized animals, we did not. Can we use this conundrum to try to solve? Uh, can we use the continuum? I'm sorry, the continuum between the synchronized and the synchronized state to solve the, the conundrum between criticality and synchronization? Can I try to use this thing to address it? And if so, how? How can I explore this continuum under some kind of at some control and do the statistics? And the answer to the question it comes from biology. Okay, the answer is urethane. Urethane is a kind of anesthesia, which is what I'm going to I'm going to describe now. So uh, the result of this now comes from this uh, paper we published last year with Antonio Fontanelli as the first author in which we used urethane anesthetized rats and we used the, the experimental setup that I mentioned before, the sodium silicon probes, and measuring the uh, primary visual cortex of the rat. So what you're looking at here, please look at the horizontal time scale. This is time, measuring seconds. So uh, 10,000 seconds here, I'm talking about uh, two, three hours of recording, depending on the animal. And what you look here in the vertical axis, coefficient of variation, CV. So CV is just a very, um, uh, uh, Professor Mauro, sorry, yes. you have 10 minutes. Okay. How many? 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So, a, a CV measures how irregular the time series is. So each of these points here, the red, the purple, and green are measured, uh, correspond to uh, uh, um, 10 seconds, 10 seconds of activity like this, very desynchronized, very synchronized, and more something in between. So we can quantify by via the CV of the average population fire rate where you are here, okay? And so this kind of anesthesia provides you that. The rat spontaneously, the rat's brain spontaneously goes to more synchronized, less synchronized. So we parse the data by the level of, of CV 
coefficient of variation and see how it behaves in each of these uh, different uh, scenarios. Okay. And so this is low CV. This is high CV. This is less synchronous. Low CV is less synchronous. Less synchronous. High CV is more synchronous. So you can do statistics of avalanche, neural avalanches for each of these uh, behave, for each of these, these regimes. So you have a continuum of regimes from low to high. We parse by different left values of CV. We calculate spike avalanches like I explained before, and look at the statistics. So size distribution here and duration distribution here. This is, these are the exponents for the canonical model, for the standard model, direct percolation. And you see that it does not always agree. Here I have 1.69, here we have 1.92. These exponents actually change, change continuously with CV, which is kind of strange because exponents should not vary continuously. Is there a criterion to choose which are the true ones among these exponents? And the answer is yes, from theory, from statistical mechanics theory. So the theory goes as follows. If average size and lifetime t, left, less, uh, size s, lifetime t are parallel distributed, then the average s given some duration t should scale as, as uh, t to, to some power. And this power is a combination of, of um, critical exponents again. And this we observe in, in our data. And again, this one over sigma nu z, this combination of exponents, uh, also depends on CV. So t, tau depends on CV, tau t depends on CV, one over sigma nu z depends on CV. It looks like a mess, but now enters theory. So if those three scalar relations are satisfied, then if the really system is really critical, you expect those three different exponents not to be independent, but they're related to each other in what is called a scaling relation in, in statistical mechanics. So please note that, that the two sides of this, this equation, of this relation, depend on CV and can be independently evaluated. The left-hand side I get from one kind of plot and the right-hand side, right side I get from different kinds of plots. So every, the right-hand side and the left-hand side are varying experimentally as a function of CV. So the, the, the question is, is the relation satisfied as CV changes? And the answer is yes. So as a function of CV, here I'm plotting the two sides of this equation. You see that there's a nice crossing here in the middle. The different symbols here are for different animals. So uh, there's some, some variation here, but they do cross approximately the same point. So there's a, a, a critical point as some intermediate CV value with some residence time occurring right at, at the critical point where the, where the crossing occurs. And we also try this from public available data on freely behaving moving mice and some anesthetized macaque monkeys. And uh, the plots are uglier, but still you see the crossing. The crossing means that the scaling relation is satisfied and therefore uh, have a signature of a critical point. So and now we have a critical point. If we look here at the crossing, are the exponents compatible with, with the theory? So I, I go back again to this uh, plane of exponents and see that look that for anesthetized rats, the exponents are 1.5, 1.7, and for really moving mice, uh, 1.7, 1.9, and they're not compatible with mean field direct population with the black dot here. So it doesn't look like compatible with mean field direct population, seems to require a different model, different exponents for anesthetized and freely moving animals, and even away from criticality, tau and tau t follows this kind of scaling relation in tau tau t plane, even for the ex vivo turtle for other, for other um, experimental data. So this is our, uh, our paper from last, last year. And they were, this is the take home message of that paper. But one of my students, Tawan Carvalho was not in agreement with that. He was very persistent. And he said, mm, is that so? Is it really true that we need a new model? I mean, the exponents are different, so, right? So what is, is what he decided to do? Let's see, let's take a mean field direct population model, but subject the model to the same constraints as experimental data. So first of all, severe subsampling. We measure hundred neurons or so, give or take. The rat brains has much, 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 many, 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 many more neurons than that. So let's do the same with the model. And then do the same thing, parse the data by CV, print the data and check the exponents. So we, we took a very uh, 
simple model of excitatory inhibitory neurons, which had been, had been published in, here in 2020. And you, you, the control parameter is this small g. So g controls the inhibition of the network. So if g is large, activity dies, you go to absorbing state, and g is large, you are active behavior, okay? This is all you need to know. And g 1.5 is a critical value. <coughs> so first of all, is this model really in my field of field regulation? Let's do full sampling. I can simulate 10 to the fifth, to 10 to the five neurons, okay? 100,000 neurons I can simulate my computer. And we do, this is what the model looks like for supercritical blue, critical red, and supercritical purple. You do the statistics and you do get mean field director population exponents as you should, okay? So this is just a test. Now, what happens if now you do like experiments? In the experiments, you cannot sample all the neurons from the rats. We don't know how to do that yet. So let's take you sample 100 out of 100,000, okay? So it's a factor of 10 to the minus three. Yes. So what happens now is very interesting. If you do this analysis for the model, but subsampling the model, you do see, you see here in the different colors here, I'm changing the coupling of the model. And this changes the CV distribution of the model, which is nice because the data has CV distribution. And this is what a, a, a low CV in blue looks like and a high CV looks like in, in red. And this is what the apparent exponents, the apparent parallel look like when you have undersampling, subsampling in the model. In the, in the model. And this, this is what it compares like with the data, okay? So except for the upper plot here, the statistics here look alike. And if you revisit those results that I shown before, here I'm just showing you again with different data, okay? Newer data obtained in our model here in Hesifli. You see the crossing here for the animals of the scaling relation. You see the spread of exponent here around the critical point. You, you do have some fluctuation here, but you can still take an average and some deviation. And this is what the model looks like. So the model with subsampling can reproduce the data and very strangely with exponents which are not in field reactive percolation, okay? So just to be clear, the model in its full sampling is here in the black dot here in their theory. But if subsample, because of the noise you create by subsampling, you have fewer neurons, the apparent exponents you're going to measure in your power laws distributions the exponents are going to be distorted and they are distorted in such a way that it looks like experimental data. And only if your model is near the critical point. So the critical point was 1.5, right? I told you here, if you go like 3% off criticality, your, your model results no longer agree with experimental results here. And I'm, I'm just showing some uh, results we get from the subsample model. I know I, I'm, I think I'm done with my time Right? How much time do I have? Like, can I just conclude? I'm going to skip some intermediate plots. I'm going to conclude. Okay. Okay. Um, what I've shown you is that I mean, field direct population model subject to subsampling plus CV parsing plus binning plus all the, the things that we have to do with that data in order to analyze it can lead to apparent exponents which different from the true ones. So this is, it's a very interesting result because it shows you that you can be misled by what you're seeing with the experimental data. This is what the model suggests at least, right? And while this distortion occurs in the model, it is able to reproduce uh, results for, that we had obtained experimentally for urethane, urethane anesthetized animals. So despite the distortion of the exponents, however, the, the crackling noise, this is the scaling relation. That's the scaling relation that I showed that you have the crossing of those two sides of the equation. This crackling noise scaling relation is still satisfied despite the exponents being the wrong ones because they are not the ones uh, predicted by theory, but they are the wrong ones just because you're subsampling and therefore there's distortion in practice. So despite the distortion exponents, the cracking noise is still satisfied, but only if the model is within two to 3% of this critical point. So you have some slack here, which you can fluctuate around the critical point, but you still need to be close to, to, to criticality. So the scaling relation that we are using as a criterion to detect criticality, which is a stronger criterion for criticality, um, it's complicated because yes, the model 
satisfies it, but the exponents it, give, it gives you are different from the true ones of the model. So I also show things that uh, I may not be immediately interesting to you, but it is to us that a narrow interval in the control parameter yields a wide range of CV in the population fire rate. So if CV as a control parameter is a very bad control parameter, which is the one we used in the experimental paper because that's all we had. We have no access to what's access to the control parameter in the rat's brain. We don't know what's going on there. That's why you have to use some operational definition of control parameter like CV. And the main conclusion of the model is that mean active regulation is not yet falsified as a model to explain the data. So that's it. We have an explanation. We claim that you, uh, the data falsified the model. That's the claim of the previous paper. And now we are saying, oops, you're wrong. Apparently, you can save the model if you take into account all these effects that, that you have taken into account when you mimic what you're doing with the data. And also for the people doing on average analysis like we are doing. So this thing, this result, um, raises uh, a flag in the sense that um, from the point of, of, of view of methodological vulnerability, avalanche analysis are fragile. I mean, if you do some subsampling, your statistics change, and this could be an issue. So we're still trying to understand. Uh, so this model, this very simple model is still saved, but we don't know whether it does explain all the other phenomena uh, that are emerging in this um, experimental results, including our lab, okay? So uh, I'll stop here and I'll take your questions. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Mauro, for the great presentation. I think that we have time for maybe one, two questions. I will start with Julio. Uh, comentário. Vem de um background em dinâmicas de fluidos e me deixa bastante intrigado algumas semelhanças entre o comportamento de neurônios, a cascata em power law e o comportamento perto de pontos críticos, por exemplo, com o comportamento de fluidos em turbulência. Acho intrigante. Pergunta. Como ficaria a avalanche em situações extremas? Por exemplo, uma convulsão. Há algo aí que leve a uma explicação dos motivos disso que ocorreu? Eu não entendi a última parte. É, como como ficaria a em situações extremas? Por exemplo, em uma convulsão. Ok. Se tem alguma explicação disso que ocorreu. Ok. Tem alguma explicação sobre? Sobre a convulsão que ocorreu relacionado tá. às avalanches, eu acredito que ele quer um paralelo. Tá, veja, seguinte, então, primeira coisa é a seguinte, justamente há, há, uma, há alguma tentativa de tentar relacionar o bom comportamento dessas leis de potência como uma coisa saudável, um cérebro saudável estaria assim. Então, você pega, por exemplo, é que convulsão é uma coisa muito genérica em, 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 na própria neurologia, né? Tem vários tipos de convulsões, etc. Tal. Mas pegue um exemplo que é muito estudado, que é, que é epilepsia. Onde você tem, pode ter o, o ataque epiléptico, que, que vai, quando, você, quando ele mede, eles medem uma atividade hiper sincronizada. Então, isso corresponde a uma altíssima atividade, que se você fosse medir uma avalanche, eu tento pegar um gráfico parecido aqui, mas nem, nem ele é muito bom. Esse gráfico aqui, ó, que eu estou mostrando, é uma lei de potência, mas tem um bump aqui, tá vendo? Esse, esse bump aqui, aqui numa escala log, log não parece muita coisa, mas é um bump enorme, né? Então, isso corresponderia a um, você ter um, um tipo de atividade que é altamente sincronizada, que envolve e recruta muitos neurônios ao mesmo tempo, a, dominando a estatística da sua, da sua distribuição. Então, você fugiria um pouco dessa distribuição tipo lei de potência, que meio que tem todos os tamanhos, né? Então, é, é mais ou menos o um entendimento que está indo para aí é, é, hoje em dia. Eu não sei se eu entendi a segunda parte da pergunta. Ah, bom, e só faz um comentário. A, a, você tem razão que turbulência é um fenômeno que né, na, na, ali na transição envolve também comportamento de leis de potência e envolve aquela coisa de dissipação de energia em todas as escalas, né, aquela cascata de dissipação de energia da, 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 da turbulência. E não é óbvio que exista uma conexão com o tipo de coisa que a gente está vendo aqui, mas também não é impossível. Então, por uma coincidência muito grande, é, na última conferência, sobre é, duas últimas grandes conferências que foram pouco, cerca de um mês atrás, sobre criticalidade e tal, é, em neurociência, é, um pesquisador falou, está tentando in, entender, enxergar conexões aí, que é o Gustavo Deco, lá de Barcelona. É um professor argentino que trabalha em Barcelona, que está 
fazendo coisas nessa direção. Eu acho que não está publicado ainda não, mas ele está olhando. Então, se você tiver interesse, guarde esse nome, Gustavo Deco. Bota lá no Google Scholar que é, já já deve aparecer o paper dele sobre isso. Tá, acho que tem tempo para mais uma pergunta, professor. É, o Lucas Souto perguntou, há alguma hipótese ou dedução mais teórica para o valor do expoente na lei de potência? É, sim não. Então, por exemplo, quando eu pego esse modelo aqui, é, bem simplesinho, estão vendo minha tela ainda, né? Estão vendo minha tela aí? Sim, professor. Então, então quando, é, um, modelo, um modelo simples como esse aqui, na verdade tem até mais simples, deixa eu pegar uma, um slide anterior, em que eu, eu não descrevi o modelo, tá certo? Mas eu mencionei, ah, uma coisa começa aqui, um modelinho tipo isso aqui, em que você tem neurônios, em que você conecta com uma certa probabilidade e depois eles, eles disparam e tal, e que você contro... em que o seu parâmetro de controle é uma probabilidade, isso é o um processo de ramificação, branching process, que é o nome... Eita, era para estar tá... tá respondendo em português mesmo? Estou respondendo em português. Respondendo em português, não tem problema, professor. Perdão, eu esqueci, eu mudei para português, que a pergunta veio em não, português. Não, tem problema. É... Então, esse processo aí, por exemplo, um branch process, o cálculo analítico desses expoentes está feito desde o final do século XIX. Então, sim, certo? Esses modelos, sobretudo os de campo médio, são calculados é, analiticamente. Os de campo médio você consegue calcular analiticamente com alguma facilidade e dá esses expoentes que estão aí, 3,5, 2, para essa classe de modelos. Né? Se você sai do regime de campo médio e vai para uma uma dimensão finita e tal, aí complica, não é, já não é mais analítico, você pode até fazer coisas do tipo grupo de normalização, expansão em, em séries e tal, e, e é tudo mais perturbativo aproximado, né? Em campo médio a gente consegue fazer a conta assim, para essa classe de modelos, e dá sempre os expoentes aí. Que, de novo, nem sempre ficam os dados. Tá bom. É, tem mais espaço para mais uma perguntinha, professor, mais cinco minutos. É... Professor, se entendi, a Júlia Carvalho Leite perguntou, professor, se entendi bem, de fato o modelo contempla os resultados experimentais no limite em que a quantidade de neurônios é grande. Exatamente por esse motivo, não seria um sinal de que o ponto crítico é contínuo? Que ponto, digo que o ponto crítico é o quê? Contínuo. Contínuo? Eu acho que eu não entendi a pergunta. Deixa eu só esclarecer, quer dizer, de fato... Eu não sei, não sei se ela está falando desse modelo aqui. Quer dizer, esse modelo aqui, de fato, ele é... Espera aí. Por que ele não está? Esse modelo aqui, de fato, ele é... O número de neurônios é grande, o número de neurônios simulados. Ele é muito grande. É... E aí tem esses pontos fixos lindo, esses expoentes. Então, por exemplo, esse expoente, esses expoentes aqui, é... ele, essas retas pretas, são todos analíticos, tá certo? Isso é bem conhecido. As bolinhas são simulações. Então, parece que funciona maravilhosamente bem. Agora, eu estou amostrando... Física e estatística tem essa maravilha, né? Eu vou lá e simulo 10 a 15 neurônios e olho para todos eles. O que eu estou dizendo é que, na, experimentalmente, você não consegue fazer isso. Você só consegue é, olhar um subconjunto deles. Então, quando eu olho para um subconjunto bem pequenininho, 100, eu tenho da ordem de 100 neurônios experimentalmente que consigo olhar no laboratório. Aí, isso tudo vai embora isso tudo vai embora. E eu tenho expoentes diferentes que começam a depender de um monte de coisa. Então, a, a interpretação é que essa variabilidade no modelo é, é um artefato do fato de eu não conseguir olhar para o modelo. Quer dizer, não está olhando para o modelo todo. Conseguir, eu consigo. Eu só estou dizendo que se eu olho para o modelo todo, eu estou roubando, né? Porque, na hora de comparar com os dados experimentais. Porque para o dado experimental, eu não consigo olhar para os, os, os neurônios do rato. Eu não sei se eu entendi a parte do ponto crítico variando continuamente. Enfim, eu não sei se eu respondi a pergunta, mas posso responder mais tarde, se você quiser. Júlia, não é isso? Isso, acho que é, a gente pode continuar a discussão também dentro do Slack, eu acredito que o professor Mauro está participando, e queria pedir já também para o professor Mauro, se ele puder, já compartilha os slides que você utilizou na apresentação, lá no Slack, e aí o pessoal consegue continuar discutindo. Tá bom. Bem, muito obrigado pela participação, professor. Eu que agradeço. Obrigado pelas perguntas também e pelo convite novamente. Tá bom. Agora eu acredito que eu passo a palavra para o Vinícius.
Perfeito, então, é, obrigado de novo, professor Mauro, pela, pela palestra, muito, muito boa. É, então, agora só vou então, fazer um, um, um lembrete, agora a gente vai ter mais um top.